We on? My check one, two. It's Leron Lee. I'm a filmmaker, and I've been asked to talk about some of my favorite and influential films and filmmakers. And um, since I'm super nostalgic, I'm going to go back in time to those films that, that, that gave me the spark. I'm going to go 1999 and before. I want to talk about those films that I've seen a thousand times. If you know me, I've probably made you watch them. And um, these films uh, were special and sparks a lot of joy with me and um, directly influenced me in a lot of ways. Let's talk about some. First up, Boys in the Hood. This is a film that was almost taken for granted. We've seen it a thousand times. We know all the lines. It's highly influential. Uh, it's burned into our brains. But when's the last time you saw it, honestly? I just don't want to see you end up dead. I actually had the pleasure of watching this in the movies and had the pleasure to once again experience in the theater and it hits every time. John Singleton made this film at 23 years old. And that just goes to show that he was built for this at a very early age and his filmmaking IQ is through the roof. I love this film because it's probably the first time that I actually felt seen on film and, and experienced what that felt like in the theater. And... Um, it was something that was very true to life, and I love things that are true to life. And what this film was able to do was create empathy for people outside of the inner city, for them to understand what we were going through in our lives. If I had to choose one scene, um, there's a scene here where Trey is being dropped off to live with his father. And for the first time, we see Trey being vulnerable. And he was doing it in such a way, it was very subtle, to where he's hiding his emotions from all of the other males in the neighborhood. And this is the first time we get introduced to who Trey really is. He dropped the tough hysteria. He's just a boy. He wants his mommy. That simple. One thing that highlighted for me was we got to see this black male vulnerability on camera. And he was constantly trying to tuck it in. This was a man so afraid of feeling exposed, he even lied to his father about being a virgin. And there was absolutely no purpose for doing that. There was a moment in this film where he actually tried to show his vulnerability to a friend. And in that moment, he was ridiculed. And that struck very true to life to me. And we just never saw him open up in that way ever again until he was front of his woman and at the end of the movie in front of his father. And um, that was one of those subtle details that made this movie what it is, amongst many other things. Number two, The Wiz. Come on. I've seen so many versions of The Wiz, it's not even funny. But if I had to choose one, there's a scene where they first arrive to the Emerald City. This scene is fly. They're being directed by Richard Pryor as The Wiz. And this scene just is something that can't be recreated. It's just that fly. The music is incredible. The outfits are fly. The set design is dope. And the blackness shines through. This, this is... Uh, an incredibly soulful scene, and then it's unforgettable. I hear there's a challenge going around called the Crush On You Challenge, but I believe that the Crush On You video was heavily influenced by this scene. So number three, I have to cheat a little tiny bit um, because I have to talk about Requiem For A Dream. This movie changed my life. I think this is the movie that turned the corner for me as a director. Um, I've never seen anything like it. This movie has one of the best orchestral soundtracks I've ever heard and the perfect marriage of image and sound and editing and it was just a remarkable film. I usually don't like to watch depressing movies over and over again but the way that this uh, movie was just put together it just kind of changed everything. One thing that Aronofsky does well are the stories of obsession and the psychological journeys of these characters and he was able to tell four different stories, four different perspectives, four different journeys, four different ways about the same thing. And these characters were all in the pursuit of what they thought was happiness. And this was a running theme in his films. And it just blew me away. So we get to the scene where Sarah Goldfarb played by Ellen Burstyn, which is my favorite storyline in the film. She absolutely killed this role. Um, she's taking diet pills. We're starting to experience what is the beginning of her addiction. And there's this music playing. And this music is basically signifying this cartoonish experience that she's having. And we think nothing of it. She's having a good time. It's working. Everything's all good, right? And as the obsession grows, she starts to abuse the drug. And 
we hear this music again. Only this time it's being used for this delusional hallucination that she's having. I thought that was a really cool note. We just really get to see this wild and loony hallucination that this character is having, kind of reminiscent of a dream, which he does well. We see it again in his later film, Mother, which is basically taking this same concept and multiplied it by a thousand. But in Requiem for a Dream, as soon as that scene ends, we get the real world perspective of it and it just gives you chills. I wanna talk about the wood. I'm gonna talk about the wood. This is a film by another director who is obviously as nostalgic as I am. We see it in the wood, we see it in dope. There's a couple of things I look for in films. I look for character, the story, and heart. The wood was something similar to the kind of stories that I like to tell. Stories that are very human, but they are just unique to the likes of us, our neighborhoods, and our experiences. But even though they take place in our environments, the humanity of the stories are relatable to anybody. These are completely universal stories, and The Wood uh, is a prime example of that. So outside of this film being extremely relatable, I thought what worked really well for this film was the novelistic approach. Uh, the main character, Mike, uh, is reminiscing on his childhood, and we hear his internal dialogue, and his internal dialogue is where he is now as an adult, looking back on all of the silly and scary moments that he's experienced as a teen. And what that helped us do was, no matter how scary that situation may have been to him, we also got to experience the laugh that he was now having at himself. The movies that tend to be your favorite are the movies that made you feel the most. No matter how it made you feel, it's the fact that it made you feel. Let's just talk about the scene where he first arrives to the school. He's very green to the area and he gets himself in some trouble, which leads into a very public fight. One thing we know about this scene is that it's already happened and that he survived it. And we are now laughing at this with him. It's just a scene that a lot of us had experienced. Who hasn't been told, I'm gonna get my brother? Now you gotta sit there and imagine who her brother is and what a brother looks like and whether you can take him or not. He messed with the wrong one. Hey man, this is my fight. Okay. Number five. So I'm supposed to be picking five and I cannot bring myself to do that because there's so many films that have inspired me in so many ways. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna write down a couple of films and we're going to throw them in the pot and I'm just going to pick one and that's going to be the one to talk about. Dead Presidents. Ah, Dead Presidents. Why do I love that movie so? So Dead Presidents was the second film by the Hughes brothers. And this is a movie that I walked out of feeling like this was a story that stuck with me because I went through a journey with this character. And basically in the story, we just watched this man make the ultimate sacrifice of fighting for his country and finding out that the country was still not set up for him. So this movie is very layered. When I think about this movie, I don't think about one thing. There's so many powerful scenes throughout this movie. We get to see a journey as a young man, his journey during the Vietnam War, and what his life became after the war. So we got to see this boy make a transition to a man only for him to come home to this financial situation that made him feel small and boyish again. And that's what led to madness. So we saw him just take these extreme measures in the pursuit of a good living. So for one last time, if I had to choose one scene or one moment, I just remember his return from Vietnam and he just had this new bravado because you just experienced life in this broad way. And then you return to the place that you loved and everything has just remained still. And um, it, it's sort of a heartbreaking thing. But what the war gave him was like this brilliant confidence and cool because he just experienced so much life in that brief period of time. So we had this really cool scene where we first got to view him as a man where he walked into a bar and he's literally floating. And basically this floating was a resemblance of him beaming of confidence. And Sly and the Family Stone is playing in the background and I cannot get that scene out of my head. And it's a simple scene, but it's a pivotal scene. And I just felt like I wanted to be him in that moment. 
And that's about it. Those are five films, five scenes, five moments and films that were influential to me. And I just want to remind you to stay safe and take care.